across Australia, it's time for the exciting and predictable entertainment of The Mike Walsh Show. Yes, it's time to meet a kaleidoscope of guests from home and around the world. The stars and the stories, the entertainers of the events that are happening today. Hosted by the star of our show, Mike Walsh. more and I'll think I'm dead. Uh, I, I'd just like to thank very much Deborah Byrne and the Ross Coleman Dancers for a wonderful opening and this wonderful audience. Nice to meet you all tonight, folks. Okay, I'll take you back to Perth early this year. I was over there producing a show called The Plumber's Opera and one day I walked into a record shop and I started talking CDs to the guy behind the counter and he looked at me and he said, are you Mike Walsh? And I said, yeah. And he said, don't look like him. <laughs> oh, it's the passage of time. It's cruel. It's cruel. So what's tonight's show about? Well, basically, it's a tribute to all the talented people who entertained Australia for 13 years on The Mike Wall Show. Now, this show was something original. It was a combination of a variety show and a current affairs program. And this fortunate format basically arose out of necessity. We were doing five one and a half hour live TV shows a week and there were just not enough interesting people in variety or current affairs to fill that amount of time from either category. Plus my legendary low threshold for boredom. <laughs> so a lot of spots that would be considered quite good filler content on other shows were simply barred. There would have been no cooking, 
decorating or wallpaper hanging spots on this show. <laughs> so basically we said nothing's allowed, theoretically, that did not, did not live up to the show's motto. Make them laugh, make them cry, make them gasp and never let good taste interfere with the ratings. <laughs> and as you'll see tonight, we certainly never did. We were never very politically correct, but the show was always very entertaining. So I'll leave you now, for the time being, in the hands of some of the wonderful colleagues from that period, and young Mick and his friends. And this old Mick will join you later with Bert Newton to swap notes and observations on some pretty great years. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yes, it's the Mike Walsh Show News. Two and a half hours of the best and craziest moments from over 3,000 hours of live national television. And guiding us on this sentimental journey will be Mike Walsh Show favourites, Jeannie Little, Mark Holden, Florence Henderson, John Michael Houston, Mike Williams, John Wood, Ida Butrose, George Negus, Phyllis Diller with a special appearance by Bert Newton. After the break, Denise Drysdale. You are a natural mother, are you? Natural feeding? No, I tried, but no, I'd been around too long, I think. <laughs> I'd like you to give a welcome to Denise Drysdale and young Peter. Give them a big welcome. Look at me back then. And if you think I look different now, that baby turns 18 this year and he's six foot tall. I really loved doing the Mike Walsh show because I loved his audience. A lot of them were mums just like me and they knew what I was going through. I read somewhere or someone told me, give them lots of different tastes then they won't be fussy eaters. So I gave him a banana at about... <laughs> he was about ten weeks old. <laughs> <laughs> a whole banana he ate it. And the nursing sister nearly, the, nearly died and I, I wasn't even game to tell her I'd given him cherry juice. <laughs> Can you imagine what it did? <laughs> Blue, everything. <laughs> Complete clean out job, wasn't it? It was, and it was yeah. blue. And I just made any more. I was wasn't blue. going to. I know, no, no. <laughs> Moving right along now. <laughs> and it did. No, I... <laughs> I'm glad those times have passed. By the time the show moved to Channel 9 from Channel 10, there was always a waiting list to get into the audience. But in the early days, they'd crowd a few unsuspecting ladies into the tiniest studio you've ever seen. When Mike had a boomerang throw on the show, they were lucky to get away alive. Up here. <laughs> Audiences are the same the world over. You can't win them all. Now, actor Trevor Howard had just had enough drinks to make him want to sing Sweet Sue. Now, he was doing his best, but the little lady in blue in the front row wasn't going to clap. No way. Under any circumstances. I want to thank you for your warm introduction. And I was listening to it for a moment, and I thought I was dead. <laughs> no, you're very, you're very kind, and I want to tell you something. I've been on any number of these talk shows in America, but I have never appeared on any of them and have seen and looked at so many attractive, young and matured women as I see before me here this afternoon. Veteran comic George Jessen, he knew how to handle them. Flattery. I let, I let my eyes panorama right, left. I'm not dismayed by the lights. They're a deep brunette, they're a touch of grey, they're a t-shirt head. It's like looking out upon a garden of roses. Of course, here and there, there's a weed, but that's... <laughs> When flattery fails, a can of courage draft, perhaps. Sir? What's your name? Dot. Dorothy? Dot. Dot. No, Doris Dot. May. Dot May. Mm -hmm. Oh, another little May. Dame Edna knew how to relate to them as well. And were you listening to the Weight Watchers, woman, darling? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I was watching you. I was watching a bit of weight as she was talking. <laughs> 
have you been cuddly, darling? <laughs> Long time. You're not so life. much a dot as a punctuation mark. <laughs> But Mike was very keen to defend his audiences from critics like Kathy Lett, uh, who called them Russell the Blue Rinse, rinse Set. <laughs> you're getting a bit phased by all this talk of below naval geared things, I think you've... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, your, that's your dumb safe preoccupation because as a journalist you've never seen this bloody show. You think it's all about home knitting and patterns and it never has been here. <laughs> For 12 years this program has always had guts and balls and will continue to do so. You don't have to sweat like a horse. Sometimes, though, a hot studio and a long story from Bette Midler like could have like a calming that. effect. <laughs> you got one for you. <laughs> Where's the lady who was asleep? Where is she? <laughs> What's your name? What's your name? Elma Good. Huh? Elma Good. Well, what were we doing wrong? not so good. <laughs> I've been kissed by a Jersey cow in heat, but this is worse. But Mike found out that a live snake was a really good way to wake up the girls. Oh, look at that one go! <laughs> I'm worried I might get strangled. Would you help me? Would you call yourself a Christian? I am one too. Will you help a fellow Christian? Nature's creatures were always welcome on Mike's show. Our friend Jeff Harvey introduced a singing pig. Okay, this is the last one. And then he brought along so his pet ferrets. One was cute, the other in the box, Brumbles, was an absolute killer. <laughs> when I was guest hosting one day, I met a lovely chimp called Mr. Mugs. Oh, he's got cold hands. I'll have to get him some gloves. Hello, sweetheart. He was just gorgeous. But they told me later that he could bite your hand off if he didn't like you. Thank God he liked me. Mike interviewed a talking dog. Mm -hmm. And while we're there, can you say hello to all the people? So if I say hello. <laughs> There's an awful lot of mums out there, Sappho. What about saying hello, mum? <laughs> And Jeannie introduced him to a dog which quite liked him. Oh, it's an art. <laughs> Mike didn't mind him either. Titan! Sit down. He is, he is sitting. Some of the animals on Mike's show could really get carried away. <laughs> Another first. <laughs> it was a classy show, all right. After the break, one of Mike's favourite guests, a lovely lady, Mrs. Brady herself, Florence Henderson. <laughs> I want to thank you, really, for being so generous to me on this show. You really make everyone feel very special, well, and I appreciate it. Well, he is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I could take more of this. <laughs> Give a big welcome back indeed to the Mike Wall Show to Miss Florence Henderson. A very good evening to all of you. When I think of my many visits to Australia, I always think of my dear friend, Mike Walsh. He always made me feel so warm and so welcome. And doing the Mike Walsh Show, was truly a privilege. Well, Jeff Harvey's band was so good, and Mike really knew how to make a guest feel special. And it's no wonder. Mike was the perfect host. And when he struck up a rapport, well, I have to admit, it was a little bit like flirting. You don't look very ordinary. You look very virile, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to play hard to get today. <laughs> Listen, we could get together. I was... <laughs> Forget Joan Collins. I look quiet, but... <laughs> well, um... This is a recording. We're a week together. Some affairs don't last that long, do they? Speak for yourself. <laughs> Usually, when I've gone out with someone, I end up living with them for a year and a half. I mean, I... What are you doing tonight? <laughs> Thank you very much for being on the program today, Mike. Lovely 
the scene. Thank yeah. you. And uh, don't forget, some of the concerts are still on, so... <laughs> Oh, well, win in Rome, okay, right. <laughs> Mike interviewed thousands of actors from all around the world. He talked to great names from the golden years, like the wonderful Jimmy Stewart, the very distinguished Gregory Peck, and the remarkable Alfred Hitchcock, who talked to Mike in Hollywood about his very last picture. All I did was to make it mystifying, was to serve all the food blue. <laughs> Mike ran into a bit of trouble when Danny Kay caught him checking his next question. <laughs> He's reading. Did you see him? I was talking. He was looking over there reading. <laughs> <laughs> you have conducted all the major orchestras in the world. I have put all these in the world. <laughs> Over the years, Mike introduced the new breed Personal. of Hollywood royalty. Well, Names okay, like Bobby De Niro, here, who know, was fresh from his role in Raging Bull. Ah, uh, Mel Gibson, who had just finished Gallipoli. Yeah. And a new young star who had made a very big splash in Pretty Baby, that yeah. darling Brooke Shields. Quite impressed to see this photograph of you and a very swinging gentleman at Studio 54 in, uh, <laughs> in New York. Um, is that normally the age group of men you go out with? <laughs> I do like older men, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> when did you meet George Burns and what was the story behind that picture? Uh, well, we did a movie together called Just You and Me, Kid. Oh, I've heard about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we were just doing some publicity. We went to Studio 54 in New York. We did the two-step there. <laughs> the two-step? Yeah, he taught me how to do the two-step and I taught him some disco. <laughs> <laughs> well, if learning disco at Studio 54 was a shock to Georgia's system, imagine how he felt when he met the Mike Walsh Show's resident crazy lady, Jeannie Little, Jeannie Darling. And a cousin of mine put them all into the big back of a van and a friend closed the door instead of the owner locking it. And so they're all inside the van about 70. And my auntie, who's over 70, she's only a youngster in comparison to you, was just sitting there sound asleep and the truck went around the corner and the big door slid open and she just fell out on the road. And then it went around another corner and the door shut. So after about 10 minutes, everyone said, Where's Auntie Lottie? <laughs> and they said, I'll oh, stop carrying on. Then they discovered she wasn't there. And after they turned around and went back, they found her still asleep on the road. <laughs> and she didn't even know a thing. I didn't understand a word you said. <laughs> I'm with you, George. The Australian accent, especially Jeannie Little's accent, can be difficult for us. But producer Alan Carr didn't worry about that when he cast the movie Grease. He admits he was even tempted to offer Mike a role. And you wouldn't test for me, so that's why you're not in it. I sent you that cable and I said, I know. would you grease I'd up your hair? I've been trying to keep this away from people, but you are dead keen to get me for it, weren't you? Yes, and I, and I said, would you put some Vegemite in your hair, squeeze it back, yeah. and you could be a 50s rock and roll person. And then you never answered yeah. me. And you gave it to that crumb called Travolta. I know. Yeah. Olivia was uh, was who I went after for that part. I'd seen, I'd heard her songs and, and seen her on the, on one of her specials and yeah, her yeah. album covers and all that kind of thing. And and I said there is the definitive Sandy. I had done the show, so I knew the the show quite well. And mm -hmm. I said there's the definitive Sandy, Olivia Newton-John. I said we have to get her. And I was surprised because a lot of musicians aren't interested in being on film. And she was, and I was r thrilled, relieved, all of that, because she was, uh, yeah. I thought, so perfect for it. The first, like, two months of the movie I was playing, I call them Sandy 1 and Sandy 2, right? right. And um, Sandy 1, I played for two months, and everyone was real sweet to me and nice to me. And one day I thought I'd better try on the costume for Sandy 2, because I wanted, you know, to work out what hair was best with it and everything. So when John was um, recording his song at the drive-in movie, that ballad, yep. I dressed up in that outfit and just came wandering out with a cigarette hanging outside of my mouth and I went over and I leaned up against the camera. Nobody knew who I was. <laughs> but I got so many offers. <laughs> I thought, what have I been doing wrong all these months? I thought, this is what I should have been doing. The tart. So the tart was fun, but probably because she was a novelty. Yeah. You know, and uh, the, but it's amazing that just changing your clothes and changing your hair and your attitude changes because that, that's the way you're dressed. Right. Can, 
you're the same person, but the way other people react to you is amazing. Just amazing. I yeah. had a ball. <laughs> <laughs> the British stars Mike interviewed were always marvelous raconteurs. They could get away with anything because, well, they pronounced it so well. Um, um, I was in my dressing room, and uh, I was pissing in the sink. <laughs> If you knew the dressing room set up, set up in, in, in the United Kingdom, you wouldn't be surprised. It's usually about... And a voice said, how do you do? My name is Kate Hepburn. <laughs> and I was sort of pert. <laughs> over... Yes, yes. yes. Over, over sink. So I, I made sort of great washing thing. <laughs> and turned on... <laughs> and rather dripped my way into conversation with her. <laughs> she made a beautiful yes. quote about me. <laughs> this is what she said. She said, You'll never tell me, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, when I say beautiful, memorable, perhaps is the right word. By accepted standards, Trevor is a bad husband. He doesn't come home for meals. <laughs> ah! Where did, you, where did you tell you this? He stays out all night and he sleeps all morning. <laughs> <laughs> where did you hear He this? also forgets birthdays and things he has borrowed. <laughs> Where did you get that from? She made that statement to the press after you left England. Ah, uh, but she did. She wouldn't have said it before. That's marvellous. That's marvellous. Hello, 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 one back to you. Hello, great, great, great of you. Uh, Dawes isn't your real name. What was your name before you changed it to Diana Dawes? Well, now, are you going to have a stab at this? Not or today, I... not with this. No, not I don't properly. think you better no try way. and I'll do it. No. I was born with the name of Diana Fluck. <laughs> There's no now, way I'm touching that today. <laughs> very wise, very wise. Hey, OK. Hock nose, hock teeth, hock leg. <laughs> Peter just says things, you know, he, he sort of... Uh, he, uh, uh, he says, uh, Mr. Spigot, uh, I couldn't help noticing when you um, came in that uh, you are a one-legged man. Uh, now... <laughs> traditionally, the role of Tarzan is played by a two-legged artiste. <laughs> However, you, a unidexter, <laughs> are applying for the role, a role for which two legs would seem to be <laughs> the minimum requirement. <laughs> Mind you, uh, uh, when I saw you coming through the door, I thought, my God, there's a lovely right leg. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a per it's the perfect leg for the role. <laughs> I've got nothing against your right leg. The trouble is, neither of you. After the break, it's politics. And I'm quite a clairvoyant when it comes to Australian politics. Just take a look at my prophecy on the Mike Wall Show when I met union boss Bob Hawke. Do you want to be prime minister? Oh. <laughs> Well, Listen, Florence. I'll bet you, I'll bet you that I will come back here one day and you will be. Oh, well. And I hope you remember me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to welcome George Negus. Hi there. Back in the 70s, Mike Walsh invited me onto his show as an occasional commentator on the political and social issues of the day. One of the things that became very obvious to me was the way our Polly suddenly realised that in order to win the hearts, minds and votes of the Australian public, an appearance on the Mike Walt show was mandatory. I guess you could say that it was after the sacking of the Whitlam yeah. government in 1975 that the clash of the titans really began. Um, I don't think but it was Gough who struck the major blow by being the first politician to introduce his wife to an avid television audience. I wonder if you can remember what she wore. N no, 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 I wasn't looking at the clothes. <laughs> See? You had him fascinated from the word go, did you? Oh, it's just my yeah. shining through. No. <laughs> what? Well, it, it was a quite a large party, and of course I was able to see her and she me across a, a crowded room. <laughs> but in spite of Margaret Whitlam's considerable charm, in October 77 it was a knockout win to Malcolm Fraser. And as this bulletin cover graphically demonstrates, the power of the Walt Show was hard to ignore, even by the notoriously remote Malcolm, 
but our Mike was no political pushover. Here's Malcolm valiantly defending his 1979 mini budget to a somewhat less than enthusiastic Walt Show audience. That's the press that you are facing. That's the press you faced ever since the mini budget came down. And uh, I think that uh, it'd be fair to say it's, it's about the strongest criticism you've copped in your career so far. There doesn't seem to be any favourable editorial anywhere in Australia on that mini budget. Well, uh, you know, I often think that the newspapers who live in Canberra, or the journalists who live in Canberra, don't really know what Australians are thinking about. But that's a selection from all over Australia. Yes, I know. But the journalists also mostly come from Canberra who uh, promote that. I want to throw one at you. you uh, one of your statements. Uh, oh, we've lost... Only, 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 <laughs> only one? <laughs> there was a gentleman having a snooze there. And... <laughs> I think you should be optimistic and read that as a very good sign. He feels so relaxed and so safe about the state of the country he can go to sleep. <laughs> a week before the 1980 elections, Malcolm fronted up again with his best asset, wife Tammy, to help soften his pretty sullen image. And maybe there is a view of Fraser being a bit stern and maybe a view of Fraser being a little unrelenting. Never but mind, that, I know you're not. But that is... Uh, <laughs> Tammy must have helped. The libs were back in power. But the trouble is, when you're on top, there's always some bugger in the wings waiting to take your place. You must be very excited about getting that portfolio. Yes, very pleased indeed. Um, I asked the Prime Minister for it, and uh, these things aren't normally granted. <clears throat> you also asked him for deputy leadership, and you didn't get that. I didn't ask him for that. <laughs> the uh, astounding news this morning was that the Federal Minister for Industrial Relations, Mr Andrew Peacock, has just resigned from his position. And this has stunned the nation. The Prime Minister has consistently allowed false and damaging reports to be published, about me and my capacity as a senior minister. Exit Andrew Sharp Peacock. So much for the man they said only had to stay on his feet and keep breathing to become Prime Minister. But if the Libs had their leadership wrestling matches, the Labor Party under Bill Hayden had problems of its own. Well, I've been leader two and a half years, and uh, if you look at the opinion polls, there's a very high uncertain vote. People haven't made up their mind about me. And to help them make up their mind, enter yet another political spouse, Bill's reluctant partner, Dallas, to tell us what a nice bloke he really was. Well, yes, but you know, the truth of the situation, you've said it to me, you've looked at me and you said, there must be something nice about you, where is it? And I brought Dallas. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse a little modest self-promotion, here's yours truly making an off-the-cuff prediction way back at the end of 1978. I get worried when Bob Hawke is quiet. Um, <laughs> I don't know what he's doing other than contemplating his navel, <laughs> uh, curbing his language and his drinking. Um, if, he gets, if he gets the drinking uh, under control and the language under maybe he is preparing to launch an attack. Unfortunately for the Labor Party, the attack would probably be on Bill Hayden. It was 1980 when Bob resigned from the ACTU and headed straight for an interview with Mike. How much is power important to you? Obviously power is important to anyone who goes into public life and takes public office. Mm. Well, you'd obviously be less than honest if you didn't say that you got some sense of, of satisfaction um, out of power. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I would share uh, Henry Kissinger's observation that it is the ultimate aphrodisiac. I've never sort of... Uh, it hasn't uh, worked for you, has well, it? Well, uh, <laughs> I obviously haven't had enough <laughs> power. Yeah. And while the hayden Hawk power struggle kept the Labor Party busy, the Libs then, Mr Purstrings, decided it was time for him to make his debut on The Walt Show. Now, I wouldn't mind having a, uh, a flat system of taxation, provided the community were prepared to accept, a, as a supplement to that, um, a, a, an indirect tax on everything. I, I personally like think... A, uh, like a, a, I think a, a retail tax. turnover tax. I think, although that's very unpopular with, with housewives and unpopular with consumers, I think in the long run, indirect tax is a better form of taxation. Right. And the reason why it's better is that it's harder to dodge. Harder to dodge, and that's exactly what the electorate thought too. They weren't ready for any indirect tax, and by March 83, there was a new boy on the block. Here's his first appearance on the Mike Walsh Show. And I may be wrong, but that doesn't look like an Italian suit to me. But in the end, the final word went to RJL himself. Mike, I wonder before we finished, uh, if I could just say one thing. Um, to you and to all your viewers, um, I know this is your last week of the daytime show. Mm. It's uh, now 12 or 13 years. Um, I just want to congratulate you, wish you well on the change over to the new format, night time, and to thank you for the enormous happiness you've given to so many millions of Australians over the years. Well, thank you very much. Sir.
The waltz show began with Goff and ended with Bob. In between, literally dozens of pollies appeared on the show. But we've left until last perhaps the most important and certainly the most internationally famous of them all. Would you give a welcome to Sir Les Patterson? <laughs> I'd like you to welcome back to the Mike Wells Show, Mark Holden. <laughs> I was very lucky to be invited to sing on the Mike Wells Show many times. I was pretty much a pop singer in those days, but Mike encouraged me to perform to a wider audience. Now, while I was handing out carnations to the daughters on Countdown on Saturday nights, their mothers were checking me out at midday. Mike had a tremendous range of music on the show, from show tunes to string quartets. He interviewed country artists. Oh, I love to have a beer with Mike. I love to have a beer with Mike. We drink in moderation. If he drinks too much, he does what he likes. They drink. <laughs> He introduced rock stars. I don't know how long will last As long as you're here That's all I ask Move, baby, move yeah. Get in the groove now Mike had Johnny O'Keefe singing yeah. Johnny O'Keefe. groove now Let me tell you, girl, you're looking so fine oh, when your best friend steals your clothes from you You've got to sing, sing, sing And he had Johnny Farnham singing Johnny O'Keefe. The late, great Mark Hunter appeared on the show. God bless you, Mark. There were singers who'd been stars for a long time. Are the stars out tonight? I don't know if it's cloudy or bright. There were singers who had yet to make it. Hey, oh, oh, tomorrow, tomorrow. But for the other things I'd always meant to do. I've Isn't it great to see Kylie's success? Good on you, Kylie. Baby just can't take his eyes off me. Now, Mike was the first to admit that he wasn't the world's greatest singer, but that wasn't going to stop him. Watch him hold his own with jazz great Francis Fay. I went down yonder in New Orleans, in the land of those streaming dreams. Isn't he beautiful? That's the Garden of Eden. You know Let what me I hear mean. From Mike. He's Free your babes with flashing eyes. Stop the whisper with tender sighs. Stop! Won't you give your lady fair a little smile? Stop! You bet your life you'll linger there a little while. Oh, yeah. So there's a heaven right here on earth with those beautiful queens. Wait, I'm young with you, Ollie. Oh, yeah. Come on now. I'll be back later in the show with a whole team of Mike's regular guest singers. But first, 
a very historic piece of footage. You know, the Mike Walsh Show introduced a song which went on to become our second national anthem. You've written a song for us. Well, what happened was I mentioned that I was writing one, and um, the next thing I knew, Paddy Moss and Colton said, oh, and you're performing the new song. I had three lines of it done. Mm -hmm. Paddy Moss said, oh, you're performing the new song on, um, on Mike's show on Monday. And I said, oh, but it's not quite finished. He said, oh, you'll finish it. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure if I even know the words. I, I thought it was time to write another one because um, it's a long time since I wrote Tenerfield Sadler. Right. And what's this one called? Oh, you'll hear it when I, <laughs> when I sing it. He's going to find a title for it later. Ladies I'll and gentlemen, Peter Allen. I think a lot of people will be wanting to know, is that going to come out in an album or are you going to get it as a single? I don't know. What happened was uh, I, I kind of just sat down and finished it and I hadn't performed it until the closing night in Melbourne. And then I just, um, on an impulse after Rio, I just sat down and sang it. And um, the people from festival said, oh, we need that on a record. And I said, are you sure? And they said, yes, so I guess I'll record it. But I'm not doing it anymore after this. I think it's going to be Ah, huge. but he was wrong about that. After the break, Mike's singing sidekick, Mike Shirley Temple Williams. Uh, really, uh, just take it from the tap dance. Thank you very much, Tony. <laughs> As we welcome the pride of Parramatta, the one and only Mike Williams. I began on the very first Mike Walsh show in 1973 as a member of the floor crew. I was what we'd laughingly call a D-grade floor manager. But Mike used to involve me more and more on camera until I became part of the team. I used to sing and clown and generally muck around. But being around for all those years really gave me a chance to observe Mike's ability to keep the show's engine running. He was petrified of the cough count. Now that was when the audience started coughing, he knew to change tack. Because the audience was two-thirds female, he knew that sport could be a subject to get them coughing. But when you look back at it, Mike had the knack of making a blokey subject like sport interesting to his audience. We had all the winners as guests on the show, and he'd usually find something other than sport to talk to them about. Uh, the, I'd love you to tell people when they did This Is Your Life on you. Yes, and uh, they ever. they'd walk up and say, this is your life, and some people would say, no, bugger off. You know, what, happened? <laughs> <laughs> what happened with you? There were, there were lights everywhere. And I thought, my God, I'm being raided, what for? And I thought there were some kids down the back, maybe they were uh, smoking marijuana, and I thought, my, you know, I really am in trouble, I'm being raided. Yeah, no, Zadie, this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> and then and you... Roger Clemson said to me, Dawn, this is your life, and I said, well, they did cut. <laughs> <laughs> But while Aussies were winning medals, cups and trophies during the 70s and 80s, Mike and his audience were there to welcome home the heroes. Was the real Saint Gould? Like the dolphins, like dolphins can swim. 
The Australians would have to lose a rider to lose the gold medal. Here's the gold medal to Australia. A sensational performance by Australia's Michelle team. We can be them forever and ever. We can be heroes for just one day. didn't stop clapping and it was like it was like the whole crowd was my family. I always had the feeling that I could do it, and uh, it was a real challenge for me. Riders are still the champion of the world. Yeah, you know, it's a great feeling, you know, especially when you can reach the ultimate. That's all over! Did you have a glass of champagne yourself? I had a lot over my clothes, but not in my mouth. Rod Laver, champion at last. I think I probably played my best tennis at Wimbledon. Yeah. At, uh, either the atmosphere or the crowd, I think it was a general combination of it all, where I, it seemed to bring out the best of my game. I think nobody should be ever sent near any games of any description. <laughs> I, I loathe all games. I, I, I thank God that my children are equally as futile at them as I am. I do not believe life should be lived kicking a ball or jumping a fence or falling over into a sandpit. I believe there are important things to do, like appearing on chat programs with eminent, <laughs> eminent hosts. I believe in art. I do not believe in sport. If I see a man jogging, you know, I put my foot out. Or else... <laughs> I say, stop thief, stop thief! And somebody, somebody catches him and hurls him to the ground. <laughs> it's just as well Mike and Robert Morley felt that way, because the Mike Walsh show was a terrific showcase oh. for the arts. There's one about Uncle Eddie and I. We used to go up uh, pig shooting away up in the hills, and we used to stop off at this little rundown farm that was owned by a mate of the uncle's. He's, uh, his name was Giblets Ryan. Giblets Ryan. Yeah, Giblets. <laughs> I was one of a huge number of jobbing actors who were invited onto Mike's show to plug our latest play or film. And he'd buy the biggest chooks he could find, take them back, feed them up and breed from them, you see. As I remember, I was appearing in a play called Bullsh, which was a collection of Australian yarns. All of a sudden, this bloody great rooster had come in. Biggest rooster I've ever seen. He'd jump up on the tail, he'd go around picking at your bread and scrape. It was a terrible job to push the bugger off, I can tell you. He was strong as an ox. Jim Mine involved a rooster Jeez, that scored about two and a half on Mike's time. scale of audience laughs. Still feeding him up. Well, next time we go up there, about six months later, this bloody rooster is enormous. And the uncle says to Giblets, you're going to invite us in for a cup of tea, Jimmy? And Giblets says, oh, matter of fact, the rooster won't let me back in the kitchen now. <laughs> the next day, my co-star in Bullsh scored a massive force 10. The proper polite word to use is evacuate, he announces with authority. So back goes Olive up the stairs muttering, evacuate, evacuate to himself. And when he gets up on deck, he clears his throat and addresses the ladies. Any of you ladies who wish to evacuate themselves should piss over the side. <laughs> you with me today. <laughs> On a classier note, Mike invited the Australian Ballet into the studio. He hosted the TV debut of Australian Chamber Orchestra leader violinist Richard Tognetti, who performed with two fellow students from the Conservatorium.
Mike himself had studied piano with the Reverend Mother Borromeo and his expertise showed. The piano was the centrepiece of many of the show's best musical items. Where is C now? <laughs> hey, they, did, they didn't mark the C here. Could you show Mr. Borger where the C is? Do you have a C? Could you play one of your... <laughs> case of art for art's sake. The Mike Walsh Show was the first port of call if you had a film to promote. A young Mel Gibson appeared with director Peter Weir to plug Gallipoli. Well, we had a long time to prepare for it and get fit. There was exercises and running and eating the right things and getting some weight off so I could look like an athlete. I was kind of porky before that. I'm kind of porky now. <laughs> oh, I'll swap you. <laughs> you want to know what porky is? If Mike wasn't a Mel Gibson, Maybe he can be a Brian Brown. OK, now this is going to be the loyalty test, right? Right. If you girls had to spend a week on a desert island with either Brian or myself, which one would you take? <laughs> I knew it wasn't worth coming yeah, I'm home. I'm Colleen McCulloch had a movie of the Thornbirds on the drawing board, and Mike was very interested in the casting. Yeah. What about the, uh, the romantic uh, sort of the uh, priest? The priest? The, I can't think of anybody. Oh, I can. Um... <laughs> now, don't you dare say Robert Redford. Oh, no, no, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say Robert Redford. I think you need someone about uh, five, nine and a half with blue eyes, Irish Catholic background, and uh, Australian, preferably, quite frankly. I... <laughs> I wonder who that could be. Uh, I don't know, but I have a terrible feeling he'd say yes to do the you, part. Do you think, do you think it, the initials could be M, W? <laughs> That has occurred to me. <laughs> Wasn't too far-fetched. Television stars were becoming movie stars in the 70s. Graham Kennedy was appearing in The Odd Angry Shot. And he knew that he'd sell more tickets if he played up the naughtiness factor. Yes, there are some four-letter words. There's a touch of male frontal nudity. Yours? No. Oh. <laughs> they don't have lenses like that. <laughs> <laughs> to be microscopic or cinemascope, I'm... <laughs> No, no, no. It's, it's the pep. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever seen you blush. <laughs> no, I'm afraid, Mike, it's sort of pepper pot and tweezers. Uh... <laughs> you know, you've got to wait till it sneezes. And... <laughs> the Walsh Show audience enjoyed the performance segments of the show, but the branch of the arts they really responded to was the launchier branch. <laughs> the 
latest attraction at Melbourne nightclub My Bare Lady was Sepia Fontaine. Would you be worried if your mother came in to see you one night? No, not at all. She thinks I'm a hooker in Brooklyn. <laughs> I wonder if that lady's still doing her act around the clubs. After the break, we talk about the way the royal family were treated on the Mike Walsh show. But you, you just you put the hand, you stick the hand along. Or a dog got Di's hand, you got Charlie's. Oh! So, you oh, stick him on the car like that, mate. Oh, isn't that lovely? Darling, aren't they beautiful? <laughs> Making his last appearance for this year, would you give a big welcome to Simon Gallagher? And I never thought I'd feel this way. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm glad I got the chance to say that I do believe I love you and if I should ever go away well then close your eyes and try and hear the way we do today and then if you can remember keep smiling keep shining knowing you can always Sure, that's what friends are for in good times and bad times. I'll be on your side forevermore. That's what friends are for. We'd like to announce our engagement. Would we? <laughs> well, you came. So much more I see And so by the way I thank you And then For the times that we're apart Well then close your eyes And loving words are coming from my heart And then if you can remember Keep smiling Keep shining, knowing you can always count on me for sure. That's what friends are for in good times, in bad times. I'll be on your side forevermore. That's what friends are for. Keep smiling, keep shining, knowing you can always count on me for sure. That's what friends are for in good times, in bad times. I'll be on your side forevermore. That's what friends are for. Long toy. Me, Porter. <laughs> we have Jeannie Little. <laughs> Shoulders. Darling, have, 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 our shoulder pads didn't sit quite properly, so when I put it on the coat hanger, it was perfect, so I left it in it. <laughs> we used to do lots of segments about the royal family. People loved hearing about Princess Margaret and Roddy Llewellyn and Prince Andrew and Coo Stark. And everybody loved the Queen Mother. 
Actually, a dear old lady called Elsa Davis wrote a tribute song to the Queen Mother on her birthday. And she came up from Melbourne on a greyhound bus to sing it on the show. Elizabeth, it's your birthday. We all say hooray, hooray. Elizabeth, we all adore you forever and evermore. Don't they make terrific reading? I mean, it's better than days of our lives. You've got, first of all, you've got the Queen, who is hard-working, a terrific woman, dedicated, right? Then you've got, you got the handsome husband, you know, from foreign parts, OK, a, sort of a glamour figure. Then you've got the, 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 the sister that's been, had her moments, divorcee, <laughs> had her moments, mind you, a lot of troubles there. Dear old mum, gorgeous old dear, feathers, lovely mum, everybody's mum figure, we all love her, beyond reproach. Then you've got the daughter that's a bit of a tartar, isn't she? <laughs> she goes around telling everybody to knock off and everything else. Then you've got the son, who's, who's again a marvellous all-round guy, terrific, who marries this beautiful young girl, lovely, and that everybody loves. It really, I can't wait for the next instalment to see who's... <laughs> no, I can't wait to see who's going to marry Andrew. It's terrific. It beats all. I mean, Hollywood can never come up with a story like this. John Michael's comments had Mark Switchboard in a state of total meltdown. But Housen didn't care two hoots what some North Shore bank manager said. Just now listen. Who comes on this program and defends the royal family and gets all the Republican gits attacking me? You know, all over the place. Ah, I'm a Republican, you monarchist, you... You go on and have a few jokes and they've come out of the woodwork. All the old, all the old biddies out there can't wait to ring up and complain. Never leave their names. Can't ring, com com wait to complain. Well, I'll tell you, the Raw family's got a terrific sense of humour and a bloody better sense of humour than you lot have got. Your pain's in the proverbial. So there you are. I just, I just couldn't wait to get on. I thought, no, I'm not going to take this lying down because I'm always defending the Raw family and I think they're terrific and I've got the deepest admiration for them. But I think they're, they're fabulous people and they can laugh at themselves. Well, they obviously can. Yes, they can. They can. These people out there can't. And if you're going to complain, leave your names and addresses and I'll call you back personally. <laughs> so I hope you choke on your sandwiches. Oh. <laughs> Did we have the North Shore bank manager, if I know what your bank is, I hope it gets robbed. <laughs> Uh, Princess Diana was actually in Australia there. when news that well, Charles had chosen his bride got out. Yeah. But I rang up uh, on one occasion and... Um, I said, uh, can I speak? And they said, no, we're not taking any calls. So I said, well, is the Prince of Wales speaking? How do I know it's the Prince of Wales came back to reply? And so I said, well, you don't, but I am in a little rage. Mark didn't get an interview with the happy couple, but he did talk to someone very close to the family. And I said, well, I find her natural. She's very quiet. But then I said, you know, she's quiet with me and she probably is with you, being the Queen of England too. She's a bit awestruck. <laughs> and I said, meeting a superstar and a... I mean, you know, all these little contacts. So it's a bit overwhelming for little Di. But I think she managed. I think you agree she's coping with it so wonderfully. And, of course, she then rings up all times of the day and night the phone is ringing. Is it Di? I think when the phone rings, I think... You know how when your phone rings, if you're on the phone, you think, well, you know, is that the milk? When, you know, you know is they're going to cut off the electricity? Is my husband going to run over or something of the kind? <laughs> when my phone rings... And this is the only difference between me and you. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ryan Teases. I think, well, is it Prince Charles, is it the Queen, or is it Lady Di? Or is it Ita Buttrose? <laughs> I know it's Ita if it's a collect call. <laughs> well, the big day arrived. And Mike had me and another lady up all night making copies of Lady Di's wedding dress. Don't you think this is an exact replica? <laughs> yes! So, <laughs> darling, so, darling, I only had an old bolt of lining in the house, no lace or anything, so I had to make do. What did you make it out of? It looks old like an lining. old circus tent, is it? No, no, it does a bolt of lining. It's still got the bolt on the end oh, of it. Oh, it has to. Yes. <laughs> and in the years since then, the older royalists have given way to a new generation of Australians who want their own head of state. I think if we've got to have an Australian ruler, it should be someone flamboyant and fun. 
like the late Frank Thring. We should find out before we elevate you to this position is what sort of king you'd like to be, like uh, the sort of king that Charles would be in Britain, which is just a, a figurehead, or would oh. you like to be a real ruler? Oh, tyrannical. <laughs> a rod, if you'll pardon the expression, <laughs> of iron. Really? <laughs> Oh, yes, one would have to be completely ruthless to get the country back into shape again, wouldn't one? What about chopping off heads? Well, what about it? <laughs> Sounds fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> After the break, it's my old dancing partner, Mr Hollywood, John Michael Housen. Let's have a big fanfare for the man himself. He's over in Hollywood, John Michael Housen. Stars, stars, stars. Well, back in those days, my whole life was spent in a whirl of glitter. Well, I suppose then I looked like Mariel Hemingway. Today I look more like Ernest Hemingway. Actually, I started off as a writer for Mike Walsh's Tonight Show at Channel 7 Melbourne. And when he moved to daytime, he brought me along as what would you call me? As the court jester. I'm Mike Walsh's little helper. John... <laughs> I used to jet off around the world and bring back all the scandal for Mike. Eat your heart out. I, I but a humble cinema owner, kneel before the feet of a great international motion picture star. Grubble, he seemed grubble. to love having me on because I wouldn't <laughs> shut up and he could have a rest. He used to call me his tea break. He could send me up. I'm so busy these days, dear, flying all around the world. <laughs> when, he was in, when he was in Hollywood, yeah, really terrific. Oh, you wouldn't believe what I heard. <laughs> well, here he is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're looking really well lately. It's a nice suit you got on, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting too good at that. I've been too good at this. <laughs> Always wanted to do this. And I could send him up. It just looks like I look every night in a disco. <laughs> See, I can't do that to you because your hair's not your own. <laughs> no, 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 it is my own. It's just been moved around a bit. <laughs> but thanks to the Mike Walsh Show, I got to mingle with stars who had enthralled me for years. Even though by the time I got to interview some of them, they were feeling no pain. I do not think, uh, since you asked me, I don't think that I was a pretty boy. No, no, no. I came in off ships for Christ's sake, and I used to look at uh, Brody, and I thought, well, shit, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be an actor for anything in the world, you know. But uh, somehow, uh, uh, at that time, why, uh, like I said uh, to you a moment ago, I was getting 43 bucks as a fireman, huh, with a P and O, and suddenly I'm getting 250 a week, huh, which is 1940, huh, with a seven-year contract that goes up to 7,000, huh. I think, well, why the f not? Let her rip, huh? Here we are in New South Wales, shearing sheep as big as whales. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that an Australian song? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> you is think there it any is. more to it? Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the words. Mm-hmm. 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 I had a terrible feeling when I said that, that it wasn't in Australia. Yeah, it was. <laughs> oh, I, I knew it was. But, you know, I felt so crazy. And to New York, New York will go down to my book of memories forever. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eliza. Thank you. You know, your eyes are the same colour as your jacket, which is really amazing. Yeah, well, I dye my eyes. <laughs> well, Liza may have been fascinated by my eyes, but a leopard called Buster wanted my whole body. Oh, he's beautiful. Now, Buster, he really does live in the house, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Oh, it's beautiful. Um, do people ever get a shock when they knock on the door and there's a Buster sort of, not your personal, you sign me, but Buster sitting there? Yes, always. I love it. Yeah. No trouble with intruders, or if they do, they turn grey in a hurry, wouldn't they? 
Yes, they leave quickly. <laughs> <laughs> You're beautiful. <laughs> if I had fun on the road, it was even more riotous in the studio. <laughs> oh, Judy, you glad to see me or what? Oh! <laughs> oh that's not Judy, that's me. <laughs> They had me singing and dancing. Do you really see clouds of that ordeal? Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. They even had me doing cabaret on ice. One of my favourite moments in the Spike Walt show was introducing the audience to a, a new cinematic process called smell -a vision or odorama. But you're given a card, girl. Do you see, you've all got your card. Now, have you got a coin? A coin. Fish around for yes. a coin. Yes, okay. I can warn you, or folks, do not scratch object. it. Do right. not scratch it with your fingernail, otherwise you'll have a terrible problem. You'll have a, you know, <laughs> stinky, stinky finger. <laughs> right. That's right, get it out. Oh, we can take up a collection later. <laughs> you get, the, get it all out. Just like in church, isn't it? <laughs> During the sermon. <laughs> and don't forget Ben's And, uh, and you can never find Sunday. anything bigger we'll than 50 cents. We'll be at 5 o'clock through till 6. Now, I want you all to sniff number two. OK, folks, this is the biggie. Right. Real hard scratch on number two. And all to the nose. Right, go. A question Does it smell familiar? Yeah, that's right. right. Bloom said yes. <laughs> what was it, John? Well, this would have been great if they'd have been filming Gone with the Wind. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> oh, we can say that. Can you use it? It's in so? the dictionary now. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> well, who's going to say it first? Jesus. Tell them what they just smelled. Well. <laughs> The word is in the dictionary, you can look it up in your Funk and Wagnall or even your new Oxford. Uh, number two was um, something that happens in bed and the word which is in the dictionary, so it's now official, Oxford Dictionary, fart in bed. That's <laughs> and after the break, Ida Buttrose takes a look at how the role of women changed over the Mike Walsh show years. You have to say to yourself every day, however miserable your life becomes, well, at least I'm married. <laughs> Would you welcome a very delightful lady indeed? Dame... Uh, no, not Dame. No, 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 no. I was over-promoting her. I'm sorry, that's not true yet. I to Buttrose, OBE. Give us a... Good evening, everyone. Back in 1975, I made my debut as a guest on The Mike Wall Show. I certainly never imagined then that some years later, I actually would be asked to host the show when Mike took a break. It was a nerve-wracking experience, I tell you. But it certainly gave me some insight into what it took to host a 90-minute show every day of the week, which Mike did so superbly. In those days, The Walsh Show was described as an oasis in the desert of daytime television. And for the 70s housewives at home raising children, it was certainly an accurate definition. Not only did The Walsh Show provide them with first-class entertainment, it kept them up to date with current affairs, but perhaps more importantly, the issues that most concerned them. In 1977, a short film made especially by Film Australia was aired for the very first time on The Mike Walsh Show. The film dealt with the plight of mothers of young children living in isolated outer suburbs. And boy, did it strike a chord with his audience. And if you think Oprah invented audience involvement, take a look at Mike's mob in action. 
I love my children. I yeah, love them my just being cry all that the time. Film you didn't. If you don't train them, you're the one that's there to train them to be good. But some they children, some at the time, but not all of the some time. Some children are whingy from the time they are born. Oh. Well, if you, if you Lady with the glasses, uh, just put a hand up. Yes. Do you give them love as well, or do you just give them training? I give plenty of love and training. You can't give them enough. They've got to have love and training, not just training. It can't be all training. Well, I agree with her wholeheartedly. And you can't tell me, because you haven't got a car, you can't go out. I haven't got a car. My husband even hasn't got one, well, so we're, we we're totally, you know, without transport. But the it, thing is, I go out with bus. other women. I go in a bus with three children under school age, oh, and yeah. I don't drink and I don't take, take Valium. Years later, they were still talking about it. Then she was struggling along with two kids in the stroller and packages, and they're just sitting there like stuffed owls. And is it really like that? Yes. It was an issue as relevant today as it was back then. The right of mums to stay at home without feeling like second-class citizens. No, there's a good thing, you see, you send them all outside with a bicky and a drink, and then you go inside and take yourself a nice cup of coffee and turn on Mike Walsh. They know they've got to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only decent thing we have on all day. <laughs> I enjoy being a housewife. I've got a man that looks after me and I love him and, and the kids. And I take a great deal of pride in, you know, the cook meals I cook. And uh, I don't have to be groveled and told that I'm a terrific housewife or a terrific mother or anything. Like the kids eat everything on the plate and appreciate everything I do. So it's obvious that I'm doing okay. And if a woman did choose to bite the bullet and take a job, the glass ceiling in the 70s was pretty low. Uh, they just haven't got the correct application, particularly to sales. Oh, I must interrupt you. Women have a better application to sales than men. Women relate better to women. A woman goes in, she wants to buy a washing machine. Tell me a man that knows how to sell a washing machine. He's never even used it. <laughs> These days, we can watch whole programs devoted to sex and sexuality. But back in the 70s, Mike was breaking taboos with topics ranging from promiscuity to PMT and everything in between. Yes, of course, the pill was one of the greatest liberate, things liberating women in the world. Come and go as you please, you do what you like, you haven't got to answer to anybody, mm. you haven't got to worry about unwanted pregnancies or unwanted children, which is even far worse. The only thing you have to worry about is a bit of VD now and then, but then that's very social now too. <laughs> that is extraordinary. I, I found some of it very, very interesting. I did. Uh, I read it before the Christmas break, actually, so it's a long while ago. I read yeah. a ton of stuff there in between. There is one diagram, you know, and that is trying to... Oh, I didn't find that. Yes, there's, <laughs> there's one, and it's concentrating on the, the clitoral structure because even the New York Times was saying the clitoris is a small bud which is located uh, just above the vaginal lips towards the front of the body at, in the hairy area. And uh, actually, that's sort of a misleading statement because... Uh, male genitals are external, but we have just as large genital structure as you do, only ours is internal. And so if the clitoris, the clitoral bud, as the New York Times said, is the external part at the front, but underneath our vaginal lips, we have these same two bulbs that you have inside your penis, and they fill with blood, and so we become swollen in the same way that, that men do when they become erect. So we have the same size. I think that's really interesting. I didn't fall asleep. <laughs> I breathed my babies out. I didn't push them out. Now, explain that to me. That sounds interesting. You breathed them out. You, um... Well, the point was that I breathed. And they came down more and more and more. And then the vagina, of course, opens up with all the tissues opening like the great petals of a flower, with the baby's head coming down through. And if one isn't straining and acting desperately, this can just happen, and one's body opens. It's like flinging wide the gates of your body, and the baby comes down to birth, and it's easier to open up when your mouth is relaxed, too, like that. And you simply breathe the baby out, and the baby slips into life. I think it's better for the baby and better for the mother. And to think I'll never experience it. <laughs> Does every woman get premenstrual tension of some kind or another? No. Only about three quarters of all women get some sort of premenstrual tension. Well, that's still an awful lot. It certainly is. Okay, well, say 50% of that three quarter 
How long a period would they get uh, any form of premenstrual tension for? It can be as much as two weeks before your period. Blimey, that means two weeks out of every month you've got premenstrual tension. Absolutely. <laughs> <Not bad. laughs> it can be. Mostly it's between five and ten days before a period. Yes. Well, even that's long enough, isn't it? It certainly is. And then you've got your period. It doesn't give you many clear days, does it? Well, <laughs> personally, or...? <laughs> Problems, <laughs> that is not one of them. I mean. Who else but Dr. James Wright could discuss women's problems with such delicacy? We try to be very discreet. Now, this thing here is, uh, well, women would know what that was. <laughs> now, um, this area here is the, the front passage, as we doctors call it. Now, just above that is a little, little tiny hole, which, unless you've got investigated, you wouldn't know it was even there. That's the, uh, the wee, wee hole. <laughs> something. The grown-ups certainly had their say, but a regular feature on the show was the Kids Forum. Here's Brett Whiteley's daughter, Aki, on the need for sex education. I mean, it's really important for, um, for the father at one stage, in the, you know, possibly when the child's about nine years old, to say, to sit them down and to explain to them and tell them, you know, without, without any hang-ups of their own, without sort of um, telling them that things are naughty or things are bad. It's, I mean, it's all completely natural, and it's, it's, it's an experiment that children have. One of the most important women of this century was a frequent guest on the Mike Walsh Show. In fact, they knocked about together back in their university days. Have you ever had the love of a good man sort of thing? The fact that you have been... I tell you what, I may not have had the, the love of a good man, but I think I've got the best out of a fair few ordinary men. <laughs> And when Mike invited Richard Neville to join in a chat with Germaine, the results were hardly what he could have anticipated. Uh, you, no. you were always worried that you weren't measuring up. Don't you remember? You used to... <laughs> <laughs> you used to always apologising. <laughs> oh, oh, it's very small, but don't you? It's small but beautifully proportioned. You know? <laughs> Those were just some of the issues that were important during the Mike Walsh Show years. And strangely enough, they're just as important today. After the break, it's comedy with Phyllis Diller. Actually, the Mike Walsh Show even tried to make a comedian of me. Glitter thongs, I ask you. Oh, super. What a stunning surprise. They seem to be exactly my size. Oh, super. Oh, super. Oh, super. Oh, super. Oh, super. Oh, super. A big welcome back to Australia to the one and only Miss Phyllis Diller. Isn't that lovely? Oh, yes. And thank you for the flowers. You look great. Are we getting married? <laughs> well, I've got the time if you've got the inclination. <laughs> well, Mike, I'm still waving. <laughs> You know, I had a ball coming to Australia and appearing on the Mike Wolf Show. I loved the audience and I loved Mike. I even had him on the floor on national television. You yeah. have to lie down here on your back with Me? your head, you. Oh, you're joking. Oh, no. Okay. I, 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 know I figure some way to do this. <laughs> right, turn off the cameras. Okay. Now, if you lie down with your head up here. Right. Okay. okay. Now, here is a sugar cube. And don't I don't like want to touch it at first. Now, you put this arm straight up. Straight up. Make a fist. Now, I'm going to try to press it down. You must resist me. Okay. I want to try to press your arm down. Ah, I can't. Now, I'm going to put this sugar cube on your solar plexus, and then I'm going to push your arm down. <laughs> See what that does to you? It weakens you. <laughs> I used to come on the show every day for a week at a time. And do you know how much material that eats up? Mike would sit me down, agree to marry me, and then ask me about fangs. And so it went on and on until he would bring up a subject I really knew something about. I, I just want to get on to the... You uh, want to talk about my face? Yeah, I'm fascinated. Oh, they did everything, dear. The whole lot. Oh, it took four and a half hours. It's the only operation ever performed by the doctor wearing the mask over his eyes. <laughs> And his assistant medical uh, man said that he'd never eat mulligan stew again. <laughs> I've often wondered what they do with all the bits they cut off. They, must they make be... wallets. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite 
wallet is the one that got the wart. <laughs> Put it right over the snap. <laughs> Mike was like that. He would love to hear that audience laugh. And he had a whole menagerie of comedians who came along to make them do just that. Laughy, laughy, laughy. Mike would always invite Dame Edna Everidge on the show when she was in Australia. Yeah. Hello, Gloria. David. It's not a name one hears so much these days, is it, Gloria? Gloria. But it is a beautiful name. It has a luster to it, hasn't it, Gloria? Thank you very much. It's lovely. And how simply you're dressed today. <laughs> You're sensible. Oh, a wise woman not to have gone to too much yes. trouble. That's it. <laughs> the thing is that Gloria, and her name is Gloria Young, and you still retain many of the ornaments of youth, darling. You're yes. beautiful, and you've made this little, oh, little, sort of little, sort of nipples on it. <laughs> This is highly abrasive. I could turn that to dust at a touch. <laughs> and he talked to her when she was overseas, although she hated that satellite thing because she didn't like heights. Right. Now, Russians could hear this, couldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Do you realize in Moscow at the moment they're watching this show and they're trying to, they think we're talking in code. <laughs> and I can't say any more because are we being intercepted? Absolutely. They're bugging us. We are being bugged. Well, there are buggers up there. On the oh, you are being very cheeky, very cheeky indeed, Mike, Dave it's what, it's, You see this loose earphone? Yes. Really, I'm having to hold you to my aperture. <laughs> well, I don't want you to be too uncomfortable for too long, so we well, should. I don't want you to slip out. <laughs> well, well, look, it, it just. Has to... any woman ever said that to you before? <laughs> Paul Hogan used to visit the Mike Wall show. This was before he started wrestling crocodiles or throwing shrimps on the Barbie. Those days, he was too busy doing impressions. How long would you spend working on a character like that? Oh, I'm working on you right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's fine. What, what are the things I do? I, I, yeah, well, you're, you're pretty hard. Don Lane's easy, because Don's fingers are going and the hands are going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <it's> sort of... <laughs> No, he's, he's poetry in motion, Don. <laughs> you, you, you dig holes in your chin. Like this, all the time. Do I? And your eyes are always sort of... I don't know how I'm going to do that. A bit stoned. <laughs> A bit what? Uh, stoned? <laughs> That's the general <laughs> glaze. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to give anything away out of school, Mike. No, no. <laughs> Six years of faking interest. <laughs> You're rather bland, mate. <laughs> no, apparently I'm hard to set up. A lot of people tell you, me. You're you hard because, it, and I mean that as a compliment, because you're on television an hour and a half a day, five days a week. And to do that, you've got to have no real annoying, aggravating sort of habits. D haven't I got any mannerisms at all? None that I can think of. No. <laughs> But the Mike Wall Show's best remembered humor was in the tradition of old-fashioned vaudeville. And comics like Sean Kramer, Jan Adele, and Lucky Grills were on hand to keep the ladies laughing. Receiveth as the sea, naught enters there. Well, here, mate, receive this. <laughs> Oh, my goodness me, it's leaking. I <laughs> wonder what that... Oh, that funny smell. It's rather nice, actually. What is it? I know it. I, I recognise it. It pickles. It's home. Oh, I simply love... <laughs> it is, too. Homemade pickles. Oh, my favourite. I'm just mad about them. Better now, thanks very much. I'll come back tomorrow and sign the form oh, and we'll put it in. Yes, right. be careful of your bag, though, no, sir. What? When your pickles are leaking. Me what? Your pickles, <laughs> they're leaking. Oh, they're not pickles, they're pups. <laughs> hey, how come we never get invited to his place? Where Tonto live, not safe for white woman. How come? Indians could see you and swoop down from the hills. Maybe six or seven or more would carry you off to their wigwam and tie you up and use you for their plaything. When are we leaving? <laughs> Jeannie Little even tried her hand at magic. And 
now we will lock the <laughs> I gotta go now. But if you're in the mood for exits, take a look at this guy. This is what I call an exit. <laughs> Thanks very much for, uh, for watching. And if you know any friends in, uh, in Melbourne, where I'll be from the 27th, or in uh, Brisbane, where I'll be from the 10th of July, do tell them to pop along and see the show. Because... <laughs> My story is much too sad to be told But practically everything leaves me totally cold The only exception I know is the case When I'm out on a quiet spree Fighting vainly the old ennui and I suddenly turn and see your fabulous face. I get no kick from champagne, mere alcohol doesn't thrill me at all. So tell of you I get no kick in a plane flying too high with some guy in the sky it's my idea of nothing to do yet I get a kick out of you This will be good, this will be good. I might not. This is titillating. I like this. I love being on the microphone, Jack. I mean, this is... I'm starting to fall. I get a kick every time I see you. Though it's clear to see You obviously do not adore me I get no kick in a plane Flying too high with some guy in the sky It's my idea of nothing to do Yet I get a kick I get a kick out of you That had nothing to do with anything. <laughs> Coming up, the man himself talks with Bert Newton. Ladies and gentlemen, Bert Newton.
Thank you very much. For those watching tonight, uh, maybe in an age group that didn't see the show first time around, I think you would be amazed to know that that sort of stuff was done day after day, five days a week, in an area which before Mike came along was somewhat of a television desert. I think the only sad thing about Mike Walsh is the fact that he's not with us regularly today. I think for those people who do remember that era, tonight they'd be having a very special night. But it's our chance to thank again the king of daytime television, Mr Mike Walsh. My congratulations on what we've seen tonight, but more importantly, congratulations on the opportunity for us to look back on a, a fantastic era. But we know that we've had a wonderful time. What about you seeing that old stuff? How do you feel? Well, I haven't seen it for years because I deliberately don't live in the past. I mean, you know, we all get occasions where we get a bit pissed and say, oh, let's bring on the old tapes. And then we're going <laughs> Thanks to an extremely impolite circle of friends, I'm not allowed to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really have stopped all that. And I mean, I, when they were putting this together, I said, well, I, I want to be fascinated with the same as everyone else on the night. So there's a lot of things I really don't remember, but there's some very good things. What was your secret to doing it five days a week? <laughs> um... <laughs> and also, we'd like to get to the television show too, if we could. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> We can discuss either, Bert. It depends which one you want tonight. <laughs> I think the only interest I have now is basically in television shows. <laughs> <laughs> know the feeling, buddy. Yeah. Well, so um, you, the, the, well I, I think the thing was we had a terrific team of people like the Mike Williams and all these people around who really made it, and Jeff and all that, who made it so funny in the studio every day and the gags we had with the audience and backwards and forwards and all that kept it fresh. And, you know, there were, there were days that was very tough. And days when you get it wrong, days when guests didn't turn up and you'd have to improvise and you'd be wondering what to do. And it got very hard. And you got things wrong quite a bit. Of the tens of thousands of guests that you've had uh, on the show over all of those years, that, do, you, do you have a, uh, a favourite? Oh, there were a lot of people I loved. I mean, Bacall was a marvellous one. Lauren Bacall, we had her out for a week. Debbie Reynolds for a week. Uh, Kenneth Williams for a week. I mean, magical stuff. But some of, the, some of the Australians were great fun, like, um, well, wh one of my absolute favourites was this nun. And she was a last minute idea. Someone said, we've got this nun for you. And I said, you got a nun for me? <laughs> and I said, I said, what are we going to do with the nun? Well, let's put bums on seats. And they said, well, she does magic acts at kiddies' parties. <laughs> and... Then they really, then they really, well, then they really kept it and said, she also entertains old people. And I said, you mean ones who are so sick they can't get out of the room while she's on? <laughs> so I didn't really approach it with great enthusiasm, but I was wrong. Sister Stanislaus was a hit. If you want to meet Sister Stanislaus, here's our chance right now. <laughs> hey, Danny boy. There's something wrong with it. Play for people like that, can't you? Yeah. I don't know if they've both gone to that big concert party in the sky, but Dorothea was a friend and they used to travel down together and uh, they just loved it. They used to come from somewhere in Queensland. Wonderful <laughs> spot. You're a perfectionist and a lot of perfectionists have a problem uh, in, in maintaining a show for as long as you've done. Yeah. I'm also told that you're a you know, hard taskmaster, which I understand, but yeah. the person you were hardest on during that run 
was yourself. You, you led the way. Is that a fair enough comment? Yes, yes, it was. And in fact, I think that's why I thought I'd run out of steam on the whole thing, because I just sort of, you know, I tried to top myself all the time, and you can't do it. I mean, as I said in the opening, I wouldn't put up with dull spots. Mm -hmm. So I kept saying, it's not exciting enough. We've got to have this, we've got to have that controversy or entertainment. And I just wore myself out. What about the most awkward moment over those years? Well, there were so many of them. <laughs> I mean, oh, foot in mouth disease was invented by me. Um, I mean, the, the worst thing is if some spot had fall out and you're like, you had someone major coming on, and so you'd allowed 20 minutes for them, and suddenly they're not available. Well, there's only so much you can do with Jeff and his ferrets and Mike Williams and his girlfriends. <laughs> you know, and I, I, you'd sit there and think, what are you going to do? So, so they'd all run around and try to find someone to replace the person who'd fallen out. And someone came up to me and said, oh, we've got the Duke of Marlborough for you. <laughs> Never heard of him. <laughs> Probably a lovely man, but I said, I've never heard of him. What do you know about him? What, what'll thrill people for 20 minutes with the Duke of Marlborough? And they said, well, we're not too sure. <laughs> and I said, well, why have we got him on? And they said, we've got nothing else. <laughs> now, silly old me, but that, that always appealed to me, that argument. You went with it. I went with it. And anyway, I knew nothing about him. I said, well, tell us something. He's done. I said, another boring pommy royal, you know. And they said, well, no, actually, he was married to Tina Anassis. And I said, ah, excellent. I'll get all the dirt in the Anassis family. You know, what's Jackie really like and all that? So he got on and he was terribly sort of... Gin and tonic. And I, you could hear them all going... <coughs> in the so they were trying to, trying to throw him the Sunday punch. Do you see much of Tina Anassis these days? This is in-depth Walsh. He looked at me and said, hardly, she's been dead for four years. <laughs> so we got rid of him and Jeff talked about his ferrets and Mike talked about his girlfriends. <laughs> Yet again. Now that's not on tape, unfortunately. That's no, been... Thank God, no. Yeah, yes. It's been wiped. I wonder by who. <laughs> but just a couple of questions uh, to one of. Number one, any regrets? I don't think there's too many regrets. I mean, there were some dreadful times, but I mean, you know, there's some wonderful times too. Would you come back and do it again? I think tonight has shown us quite a bit about Mike Walsh and the sort of television show that you can produce. Would you do it again? Yeah, produce is a different thing from performing. I mean, I was dropping it before the opening remarks. I mean, I've forgotten how nervous you can get. <laughs> I had six peas, and <laughs> I'd really have rather had a seventh than come out and say hello. <laughs> but once I got past that, I was OK. But, you, I, you know, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, you think after all these years it'd just be a breeze, but it never is, is it? You haven't answered the question. <laughs> no, but it's bloody good evasion, you must be. <laughs> So the answer, I take it, is maybe? <laughs> what was the Sam Goldwyn one? I'll give you a definite maybe. <laughs> well, the, uh, you've not given us a maybe tonight. You've given us uh, some magic moments. Bless you, Mike. Thanks, Bert. Thank you very much. And the important thing is we have a chance again to, to thank Mike Walsh for some wonderful times. Thank you. Thank you. And now, from the... Uh, to wind things off for our, for our finale, we go from the mature Mick to the uh, <laughs> Young slightly Mick. younger Michael Walsh. <laughs> Mark Holden with that beautiful song, As Time Goes By. You must remember this A kiss is still a kiss A song just a sign The fundamental things apply as time goes by And when two lovers woo They still say I love you On that you can rely Warm 
on the old days, but I can tell you honestly, I'm never one to, to look back. After all, what's better than the fun of living today? <laughs> Don't you realise we're living today? I'm happy to say in the good old bad old days. Taking the breaks and making mistakes in the good old bad old ways. Why some people say they long for the old days to take them Way back when I'd sue to stay right here in these gold days and go through that again. Seems to me you're either out or you're in, you lose or you win in these crazy mad old days. In war or in peace, they still never cease to amend. to thank you very, very much for uh, coming with us on a trip down memory lane. And I'd like to especially thank everyone tonight who took part. It was just wonderful of them. And old Mick thanks young Mick and all his friends. <laughs> and they all look so bloody good still. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, to you lot all, thank you very much. Good night. Have a good time. And you lot, let's party. Oh, Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. The best memory I have all is of Mike himself because so many compares of shows like that when they're interviewing, they want to be the stars. Mike always stood back and allowed the guests to be the star. And that's a pretty rare thing in this industry. Veteran of television Absolutely. and a, such a champion, I think. What I liked about the Mike Wallace show is that uh, I always reckon Mike took risks. Mike had me on the show for about four years as a, as a young reporter. It was a fabulous time, and I learned a lot from the master. The family part of it, which I really love, was one of the happiest shows I've ever done in my life. What Mike gave me in 1976 was an opportunity to feel comfortable in front of the camera and to try different things. Here's a lady who was in the first audience of the Mike Walsh show. That's right, I was too. I was in the first audience. I've been all through the Mike Walsh show. Mike's been almost irreplaceable. I thought it was such a wonderful show. To my darling Mike Walsh. Mike, God bless. Stay well, stay happy. See you soon. This has been a Hayden production for The Seven Network. John Brennan speaking. <laughs>